European development programs and strategies. He has worked extensively in the field of research infrastructure and is project coordinator for the Horizon 2020 funded project's European e-infrastructure services gateway, the e-infra central, and of the Repath project that is the, uh, the center of the, the presentation uh, today. So I leave the floor to Alice there, you have 20 minutes. Okay, <clears throat> good morning. Um, the advantage of being in a, a dark, windowless room today is that uh, we don't suffer from the impact of climate change uh, that's happening outside. Um, last week I was with, uh, with John uh, Wormsley in, in Tallinn. It was also very beautiful weather. And there we were in a former power station uh, which had been converted uh, into a new conference center. So uh, we can see changes and evolutions uh, both in climate and in the way we use buildings uh, for conferences and other uh, aspects. So I, I'm going to talk uh, today uh, about uh, RI Paths. Um, you can see that uh, CERN, our hosts, are uh, one of our partners, uh, along with uh, uh, CIL, who are also present, uh, Sylvia and uh, colleagues, uh, European Science Foundation, Fraunhofer Easy, uh, Elixir, which is in the micro, uh, bio uh, life sciences field more generally, um, Alba, Synchrotron, and, and Desi, which many of you will know as well, of course, from Hamburg. Um, so we have, uh, the, the project is, uh, um, I'll give you first a, a quick overview on, on what the project's about, and then um, to tell you a little bit more about some of the results that have emerged to date. Um, so the, the, the project is uh, uh, one, of the, one mentioned by Margarita and a couple of other colleagues during their presentations. Uh, was launched in January 2018. It's funded by Horizon 2020. Uh, we're running for 30 months. Uh, so a budget of a million, uh, a million and a half, so a lot less than the future Circular Collider's budget, but hopefully with some, some impact as well. Um, what's the mission? Well, we're, we're really trying to develop, uh, I would say, a toolkit, uh, an operational toolkit, something that can be used both by managers of research infrastructures, by policymakers, uh, by civil society, by uh, members of the European Parliament, the Commission Services, and so on, to think about the sorts of impacts, the value, as uh, Johannes said in his introduction, uh, what is the value of investing in uh, big science and research infrastructures and smaller science as well. So uh, it was mentioned, uh, you know, DG Regional Policy of the Commission has funded a lot of research infrastructures of a smaller scale, mid-scale, even quite small scale uh, across Europe uh, over the last decade or so. So a lot of investment gone into scientific infrastructure, scientific equipment, research infrastructures of different scales. And so what we're trying to do through this project is, is build on what's already existing in terms of the different methods, uh, uh, tools and so on. I think Massimo will give an insight into, into cost-benefit analysis, I think, a bit later after, after my presentation. So that sort of range of tools and methods that can be used, but also to try and, I would say, co-construct with uh, the research infrastructure community uh, a, a methodology, a model, if, to, to give it another word, uh, that can be used and applied uh, in an operational basis. So, as I said, we started in, in January 2018. One of the first things we did was try and work out what's, what sort of typology, what sort of types of research infrastructures exist. So we have a note on that that you can look at. Uh, I think one of the first conclusions we drew from that was it's very difficult to put uh, one specific type of research infrastructure into a box. So we had four types of, of ty uh, broad types of, of research infrastructures. Uh, immediately we started the workshops, I think people were saying, yeah, but we're, we're three or four types at the same time. So that was one of the first interesting conclusions research infrastructures in terms of their missions, in terms of what they're trying to achieve, uh, both in scientific fields, but also in terms of social or economic engagement, have very different models and pathways to that. We also uh, did a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, the sort of stock taking of what's already been done in the past. So a number of initiatives have been mentioned, such as uh, the ESRI work on long-term sustainability, the OECD Global Science Group on, on, on indicators, uh, for, for impact and, and uh, socioeconomic impact and so on. Um, so we, we've taken stock of that. There's a, there are already some, some reports available. And what we've been particularly doing since, um, since uh, middle of uh, last year, I would say, is, uh, or at least since the autumn of last year, is, is working with uh, RI managers, RI policymakers, RI stakeholders generally, 
in a series of workshops, two rounds of workshops, to actually develop uh, the framework we're now going to move into from September. We'll have a validation uh, workshop here in Brussels uh, in September. And then with the four RI partners, so as I mentioned, uh, CERN, Elixir, Desi, and Alba, we'll, we'll start testing and, and piloting, not the whole framework necessarily, but elements of that framework that we're developing with them to try and look at specific issues that they may be specific, very interested in. So it can be in terms of the human resource impact, it can be in terms of uh, the procurement impact we've seen uh, at, the, at the entrance here. There's a nice document that's been done for CERN. So the idea at the end is to arrive with something that's uh, not just a, a nice new publication on, on the Commission website or, or, or on CERN website or whatever that can be, can be downloaded, but something that's operational and living. So we want to develop something that will be a sort of creative commons that can be further developed by the application of these methods and tools uh, in uh, the in, in the res different research infrastructures. So one of the, sort of, in terms of the, the approach we've adopted, it's, it's, we're looking very much at a modular approach. Why? Because we think uh, a generic one-size-fits-all uh, one model for trying to assess the socioeconomic impact of a research infrastructure doesn't, won't work, and that's been, I think, confirmed by the, the discussions in the, in the workshops. We're looking at the sort of whole life cycle of RI development. We've seen the two extremely interesting presentations er earlier in the first session in terms of the, the square kilometer array or, or the European uh, sp spallation source and so on, that, that shows the whole life cycle and how important it is to be thinking about impact uh, you can have from a very early stage. Uh, and we're obviously looking at it in a systemic perspective. So there's very many different types of pathways to impact, very many different types of activities that are being done, and they can have interactions between them that can create uh, different types of, uh, of impact in a shorter, medium, or longer term. Uh, as I said already, we're, we're doing a very participatory approach. So uh, again, just sum, summing up that approach. So we've had two rounds of workshops, uh, the first uh, in, the, in the autumn, really building up to uh, a sort of concept note on, on, on types of impacts that we, we want to, to think about, and I'll come to that in a minute. And then in, in the spring, building on those sorts of types of impacts that the, 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 the RI managers and, and stakeholders that were in the workshops uh, felt were, were the critical ones. We've then tried to start building up a, an indicator or metrics and a framework to which we will then uh, apply uh, or propose a number of different methods. So as I said, the idea is then to start testing it from, from September. Uh, so a number of key milestones, the, the completed uh, uh, deliverables are, are available on our website. Uh, you can go and download them and have a look at them. We'll very shortly have a consolidated report on, on the participatory workshop results. And as I mentioned, uh, after the, the workshop in October, we'll have uh, the, the, the validated model, which will be further validated by the piloting and the four RIs that are working with us. <clears throat> so that was just a little bit about the project. I wanted to, to give you a little bit more insight into what we've been doing and thinking about uh, with, through this participatory process that we've been running in the last year. Um, and I think one of the things I wanted to stress, and I think that's come through a lot of the presentations that have already been given this morning, is that the sorts of impacts that can happen from major investments in scientific infrastructures and research infrastructures are, are not linear. They're not ones that, I mean, obviously everyone's trying to produce excellent science. I think that's been stressed by, all, by everyone in the workshop. So the core mission of most, of all research infrastructures is excellent science. But beyond that, what sort of impacts can we identify, track, trace, uh, and measure. That's really what we're trying to work through with this project. So what is impact? Well, I think I, I won't go on, go on at length because I've been asked to keep to 20 minutes rather than half an hour. So uh, I'll, I'll maybe skip some of the details here, but we can come back to them during the discussion later on. Um, but what we're trying to look at is not only the sort of in, initial effects of, of an investment, but also primary second, and secondary longer term effects whether it's produced directly, indirectly, intended or unintended. So I'm using the OECD in, uh, um, definition here. And that's one of the things that we've been working with in, in, in the working groups, which have been very interactive and very, very dynamic and a lot of very committed people working and, uh, and, and discussing with us, is to try and trace how, if we, if we make an investment in uh, a specific infrastructure or we're, we're bringing, I think John mentioned, the number of different nationalities they've attracted to uh, the south of Sweden through, through the ESS project, what sort of additional impacts, what sort of chain of causality can we see 
uh, from that as we, as we try and assess the impact of uh, the research infrastructure. So, um, obviously, research infrastructures are pursuing a, a core mission, which is science. So, the con contribution to long-term or short-term problem solution is, is one, one as aspect which has already been uh, mentioned. The qualification of scientists, but also uh, of those technicians or suppliers uh, of the research infrastructure that are working uh, to either build or, or, or run uh, or operate the research infrastructure. The impacts on innovation and productivity on the economy. Uh, opening up new perspectives in the policy discourse. So I think uh, the, the Mr. Bonney from the European Parliament was underlining the importance of the role of science uh, in, uh, and, and uh, the importance of the policy in, uh, impact of science, but also in terms of the, the impact on the broader society, on understanding uh, of issues. So a lot of the, uh, the presentations we saw from uh, the, the, uh, during our workshops from, from the research infrastructures focused obviously on their what happened with the science that was done uh, there, but also in terms of what sort of impact did we have on the understanding of science within uh, broader society in terms of the outreach and so on. And then a sort of second, I mean, I'm simplifying obviously here for the, for the purposes of the presentation, but a second type of impact is obviously the research infrastructure as a socioeconomic actor. So when you, when you decide to create a greenfield type investment such as uh, well, the two we, we saw before, before the break, uh, you obviously have a number of effects that are not necessarily directly related to science. You have the employment effects, you have the multiplier effects that were also mentioned, I think, in one of the early presentations. The types of procurement that you can have. So if you, the decisions you make on the way you procure equipment, uh, whether it's more or less standard off the shelf or trying to procure very specialized equipment in a more innovative uh, process, can have quite uh, major impacts. And the qualification effects on te technical staff beyond uh, the scientists who are uh, working on the science. So we have to think about all these types of uh, impacts, potential impacts in any case. And I think thinking about them from a very early stage in a structured way, when you're developing uh, a new infrastructure, can be critical to the longer term impacts and also the longer term sustainability uh, because you get that sort of buy-in from uh, the policy makers and stakeholders. So what we've, we've been doing uh, is then thinking about, and again, trying to simplify things here, we've thought about sort of the direct economic impact, so I won't read them all out because I don't have time, and, but you can see them up on the screen, I hope. Uh, the human resource impact, so the research careers and job development, skills development of auxiliary staff, et cetera. Social or societal impact, so in terms of new solutions, technologies, which go beyond the sort of scientific impact and which are the application of some of those sciences, uh, scientific results into uh, society, and sometimes quite surprising ones. Uh, that you don't necessarily expect from uh, the specific science that's been done at the research infrastructure. Um, and then in terms of the policy impact, I think that's increasingly important is the evidence base for policy making, particularly when we're faced with a number of challenges. And again, John, when he was closing his presentation, underlined uh, some of the, the sort of divisive elements that can happen in terms of the application of new technologies, creating further divide in society. How do we, uh, how does science and the science we're doing uh, support that? So, and I, you're not really meant to read this here, but it's just, it's just to give you an idea of some of the, these were some of the outcomes of some of the, 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 the sessions we had. So we had a very simple diagram and then we got people putting up uh, post-its and so on, trying to track uh, between uh, the different types of uh, outputs or activities that are done by research infrastructure uh, and the different types of, of impacts I was just mentioning. So I think one of the key messages here then is that, you know, our eyes and their broad interaction with society is not just about churning out papers. And in fact, in many RIs, it's not about churning out papers because the RI itself, the research infrastructure, is facilitating science, is providing services to scientists, but is not necessarily uh, itself producing uh, the papers, the scientific papers or outputs directly. And that's one of the things we, we, we were struggling with or, or discussing with anyway was even if we're talking about the scientific impact of research infrastructure, tracing that scientific impact for many research infrastructures is quite difficult. Um, so in terms of the findings on, on, the, on the sort of different pathways, uh, we, we've tried, again, simplifying things here. We, we've the sort of socioeconomic impacts, which are triggered by all our, our eyes following their primary mission, so in terms of conducting research. We have the constant use of research for a purpose. So in terms of, for instance, in the life sciences field, we may be trying to solve a specific uh, health or, or disease-related uh, challenge for society. And then we have 
RIs engaging beyond the research domain, engaging beyond their direct mission, uh, and trying to support uh, the, the sort of basis for research, scientific research, and the scientific understanding of society. So different types of pathways that we can uh, imagine. Again, given the time, I won't go through all of these, but what we've basically done in the second round of, of workshops we held in the spring was take these pathways we'd identified in the first one and then start thinking about the sorts of uh, ways we can track uh, the different pathways to impact. So again, here, uh, the obvious one that most uh, scientists will think about is publication, citation, recognition pathways. So, you know, the fact that you're, the scientific publications are seen as of uh, high quality, are cited, uh, are highly cited and so on, gives recognition to the science that's been done and can support uh, further investment in the science, scientific infrastructure. Technology transfer and licensing, also uh, a rather uh, standard one that most people think about, but again, quite difficult often uh, to track. Uh, the conscious use of research for a purpose, so user interaction and industrial problem solution and project, so actually involving users, and we heard, some, uh, I think, earlier on in one of the presentations about the importance of involving users in uh, the design, in the operation, in the, uh, in the agenda setting for a research infrastructure. And that, that sort of broad range of users, again, that we can think about in terms of involving them uh, in the process. The whole process around data in the European Open Science Cloud and how to store, uh, sustain data and make it available is obviously uh, something, that, again, in terms of going beyond the initial impact. And then the sort of shaping uh, research foundation, so the fund fundamentals of research, the contribution to standards, uh, communication and outreach. So again, one of the first presenters mentioned uh, scientific diplomacy. Well, it came up in our discussions. You know, how can research infrastructures contribute to science diplomacy? Uh, what's the role and impact of, and how do they track that through the, through the work they're doing? Uh, and of course, uh, network uh, community creation. So creating communities, particularly for distributed research infrastructures, can be quite important. <clears throat> so to sum up, what we're trying to do now in, in this sort of uh, phase that we're moving into in terms of building the model is defining the different types of uh, contributions that research infrastructures can make to science, but also to uh, society uh, and, and the economy and then helping them define what they should be doing and how they should be trying to track uh, that impact. So that's uh, something we're now trying to put a number of indicators. So uh, again, I don't have time to go into all the indicators for the different categories, but what we've done is we've compiled uh, all relevant indicators into a preliminary long list, which we've tested in the second series of workshops, drawing and past work. Um, and now we've actually, we're trying to narrow it down to a core set of indicators that are not only relevant but feasible and that's one of the key issues we've had uh, discussing with the research infrastructure managers is I'd like to track that, I'd love to track that, I'd love to understand the impact of that, how do I get the data, how do I track it over time, uh, it's much more complicated. So uh, we're trying to get a, a balance between relevance and feasibility in terms of building up uh, the, the approach. As I said, we're moving now to uh, the framework, the overall framework that we're going to propose. And we, again, we think that in terms of um, the approach that we have to, to take into account, and again, this is, this is obviously simplified, but we're thinking there's a need to obviously have this core set of indicators that uh, different, uh, most RIs will be wanting to track, but also develop a number of modules in terms of both indicators and methods for different types of RIs. So again, here just indicative uh, indicative, uh, so for instance, you might have a module for social science and, and humanity types uh, networks which have a very different uh, approach to uh, the CERNs uh, or, or, or the, the sort of physics or, or even the life science uh, research that's done in, in other RIs. So that's, that's the sort of simplified approach we're, we're thinking about. So summing up, I hope I've got a minute left. Um, the messages we're getting from the work we've done to date uh, in the last year and a half is that the RI managers want an easy to use framework. So it has to be something that they can apply in their everyday operations that helps their strategic management, that helps their operational management, uh, and that give, helps them res respond to questions from policymakers, from uh, politicians, from uh, local uh, stakeholders and so on. Uh, that helps them interact with society. So it helps, helps them tell a story in many respects. Um, and I think that's something that we're, we're very conscious that the work we're doing here needs to be something that is 
easy to use, operational, and, and is not over theoretical uh, in the way we develop the tools and, and guidance that we'll, we'll be applying. Obviously, there is always, you know, you, when you actually go down to the level of analysis, you need to actually apply a lot of detail, but for the, the, the guidance we want to provide needs to be understandable by non-specialists. Uh, so that's, that's one thing I think we're, we're focusing on. We think the impact assessment framework needs to address three main types of impacts. So the quantifiable impacts that can be captured through quantitative metrics, and I think uh, Massimo will give an introduction to that or an insight into that in a minute. The non-quantifiable impacts that come from uh, the assessment that can, for instance, a sort of social network analysis or dedicated surveys that can support uh, the, uh, in a sort of quantitative way, not, not necessarily monetarizable impacts. And then what we've discussed a lot with at least <clears throat> the, the distributed research infrastructures and, and the social science and humanities research infrastructures, it, but I think it applies to, to all types of RIs as well, are the sort of network effects that happen uh, through, or the spillover effects and the multiplication effects that are harder to, to trace uh, directly, but which require maybe sort of the more narrative case study approaches. So the mix of approaches and methods that are applied to tracing impact uh, I think are critical to actually be able to tell that easily understandable story that yes, we've created 100 million euros or dollars of value, but we've also had these sorts of impacts on society. And I think we've seen that in the previous presentations going from uh, you know, the sort of educational impact of some of the in infrastructures through uh, the sort of um, uh, you know, environmental impacts that can be, or non-environmental non impacts that can be thought of as well. So that's where we are today, and uh, if you want further information, you can follow uh, us on Twitter, uh, website, and, and LinkedIn. Thank you. Thanks a lot, al uh, for this very comprehensive um, presentation. I think it was very good to set the scene of, of the discussion about methods. and, and um, Yes, the discussion about all the possible um, impact areas that are relevant for research infrastructure and, and the stress for the impact pathways when thinking about the materialization of impacts. Um, so I would suggest that we move ahead with the second speaker and we keep some time in the end for discussing uh, the three presentations. So the second speaker is Charlotte Mathieu. She's the head of the Industrial Policy and Economic Analysis section at the European Space Agency. Since she joined the agency, she has held various posts in the Director General's Policy Office, in the DG's Office for Relations with the European Union, and for the Directorate of Telecommunications and Integrated Applications. She holds a double master's degree in aerospace engineering, and she has a second master's degree in technology and policy from the MIT. She will deliver a presentation on the socio-economic impact assessment of the ESA programs. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I will give you uh, some perspectives on um, the socio-economic impact of space programs. So I'm working for the European Space Agency. Um, I'll say a few words about the agency so that you have a little bit of context on, and then I'll, um, I'll go into the socioeconomic impact assessments of our programs, how we do that, why we do that, um, and focusing particularly on the method. So the European Space Agency is an intergovernmental organization composed of today 22 member states. We were um, set up in the 70s with eight main sites around Europe. We have a budget of about 5.6 billion euros a year, and we have designed, tested, and operated more than 80 satellites in these past 50 years. The purpose of our agency is to promote cooperation between our member states on uh, space programs, whether this is research, technology, or application of, uh, of uh, space uh, activities. So as I said, we have uh, 22 member states, 20 states of the EU plus Norway and Switzerland. Slovenia recently joined us as an associate member. We have a particular agreement with Canada with participating in some of our programs. And we have cooperation agreements with the seven other EU states. Our activities, just to give you um, an idea of the scope of what we're doing. So we have a responsibility in nearly all space um, activity areas. 
We cover space science and exploration. We have human space flight with the astronauts and our contribution to the International Space Station. We have launchers, space transportation. We work in the three uh, applications domains, Earth observation, navigation, and telecommunication. We also work on the development of technologies, obviously, and on the operations of some uh, spacecraft. The way we work uh, is that the space science program is, let's say, a mandatory program, meaning that all uh, our member states must participate to this program, and their contribution is according to their GDP. All the other activities in the agencies are optional, so each member state decides where it invests and the level of funding. So this is uh, the a la carte system. Our budget, just to give you an idea, so we have 5.6 billion euros of budget a year, 1.6 coming from third parties, meaning European Union for mainly for the programs Galileo and Copernicus, navigation and Earth observation, and from UMETSAT, the European Meteorological Satellite Agency. So we are working on them with, um, on the meteorological satellites. The rest, the 3 billion euros, are coming directly from our member states, again, space science um, compulsory, and then they choose uh, the, the topics in which they want to invest. So as you can see, about a fourth of our pro, uh, funding goes to Earth observation programs, so that's the largest set of activities in the agency. Uh, the second one is launchers, rockets, and then uh, are followed by navigation and human space flight and exploration. 85% of, of that budget is spent on contracts with industry. So our, we are proposing programs to our member states, and when they decide to go for them, we will then contract to industry. Uh, there was a question earlier today uh, about the juste retour. So we are working on, uh, on fair return uh, rules. So we are, um, we are actually... Uh, we have some constraints uh, related to uh, industrial commitments towards uh, our member states. All of that and these 50 years of experience have contributed to uh, quite flourishing to the European space industry and the success factors, just to give you an idea of how we measure our success factors, is about today uh, jobs. So we have a European space industry that sustains around 40,000 jobs today in Europe. We're successful in commercial area now with uh, good market share for our telecom and launch operators on the world market. We have world-class scientific communities and we are, we are really attractive for international cooperation. Our research and innovation centers in the space domain are recognized worldwide and we have operators that are among the most successful in Europe for launchers, telecommunication satellites. And the way we work and the decisions are made, we have a governing body, the Council, each member state is represented there. Each member state has one vote. And every year, our council meets at, mini every three years, sorry, our council meets at ministerial level. So this is what we call the ministerial council to take the key decisions on the continuation of the programs and the new programs, as well as on their, the associated funding. So this year is a year, is important year for us. We have a ministerial council in November. And why am I uh, talking about this? It's basically because we are preparing a lot of socioeconomic impact assessments of our future programs for that specific purpose, to build a case for the investment of our ministers at the end of this year in the new programs. So now I will talk a little bit about our work at the agency on socioeconomic impact assessments. I will not go into details, but there are substantial impacts of investments in space, especially now that space is more and more integrated in our daily lives. We, most of us use space on a daily basis and don't even realize it. Um, space research has brought a lot of new materials, new technologies, new ways of communicating, and we're talking about uh, very advanced technology um, at the boundaries of knowledge, and all of this as, as an impact on, um, on, on the society overall. We've talked earlier about the, this shift in terms of, of focus from science to business. I would say that we, are, we have also gone through this, the, the, this shift. Uh, the strategic interest of space, which was at the heart of, uh, of the motivations of um, the, our leaders probably 40 or 50 years ago, now we're talking about economy and growth. 
that's, that's really what, uh, what our um, decision makers are focusing on. So there is a need for evidence for our governments to, um, on the socioeconomic impact of the activities that we are proposing to them. And they want to make sure that the investment they will make will create jobs and build a competitive um, European industry and economy. So we're really doing these assessments to inform the decision-making process on the impact of our programs on the economy and society and uh, for decision at, um, at the council at ministerial level this year. So we have, we, at the agency, this is really a topic that has started about 10 years ago. And we are now reaching really a, a peak. There is an unprecedented effort in our agency to do this kind of work. We've developed the expertise over time uh, to prepare this council at ministerial level, which is called Space 19 Plus. We have conducted, um, as I will present a bit later, 10 independent external studies uh, covering almost all our programs. So socioeconomic impact assessment most of them ex ante, so trying, to, um, trying to, to put forward all the potential socioeconomic benefits of the programs proposed. Since the last council, we have also changed a little bit the focus. Last council, we had already some socioeconomic impact assessments presented to the ministers with their programs. Uh, they were all ex post, so uh, a posteriori, so evidence after the, the completion of years of programs. We are now moving towards ex-ante assessments. So for the first time, we have a number of ex-ante socioeconomic impact assessments together with the proposals of the programs. Uh, back in 2016, we had mainly large infrastructure programs like Ariane 5 launchers, like uh, the International Space Station. We are now looking into the evaluation of programs of very dif different natures and sizes of com more commercial nature, of smaller sizes, technology programs. So the, the scope of uh, impact assessment has, um, has diversified quite uh, drastically. And just to give you an idea, so for this Space 90 Plus, for this council at ministerial level, we have conducted studies on the socioeconomic uh, impact, first of all, of our scientific program, then of our exploration program, of our program on uh, secure telecommunication satellites, on our programs on uh, reduction of space debris, and on our program on planetary defense, as well on, on our programs on telecommunication and Earth observations, on launchers, and as I was mentioning earlier, also on our technology programs, as well as on our operations activities. So this is just to give you the scope of the type of uh, socioeconomic impact assessment we are conducting. Now, if I talk about the methodology, there is no standard methodology for this kind of thing, especially in the space domain and with such a scope of activities. So we have developed our own methodology, uh, started uh, with uh, some initial uh, studies back in 2012. And we are working on consolidating this, uh, this methodology. Um, I can mention also that we are working with the OECD Space Forum, so which is a, a forum of the OECD dedicated to space activities where um, space agencies uh, from the OECD countries are gathering and actually also exchanging on this uh, methodology uh, relevant to space activities. For all these studies covering all these um, different types of activities, we've tried to, to have an harmonized approach, but also tailored to the specifics of the programs. The results of each study are independent from each other, and we've tried to stick to conservative assumptions. The difficulty we have after with our ministers is that then they compare directly the numbers that they get or the type of impacts that they get from each of these studies. So we are trying to be very careful with the direct comparison of these results. In terms of assessment framework, quite standard. Uh, we are proceeding as, as defined, so def the define, definition of the impacts and indicators tailored to the programs, then the assessment methodology for each indicator, again tailored to the program and to the stakeholders, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. And then the third step of this assessment framework is the analysis of the sources of the data and the relevant stakeholders. And here, depending on the programs, we have a very uh, broad uh, uh, stakeholders communities, different scientific communities, our member states, 
our own agencies and our program managers, industry, research organization, and society at large. In our programs, we have developed, let's say, some kind of indicator framework that is built around five pillars, economic, scientific, technological, strategic, and societal. Um, I will just now give you an example, for example, of our science program, which is what I think is closest to, uh, to what we are discussing today. And I will give you an example of the type of impact and indicators we, uh, we are looking at. So if I take the scientific impact of our program, uh, typically, we look at the production volume and quality, so referred papers, numbers, number of citations, so something that uh, you're all probably familiar with. What we call interest from scientific communities, so our uh, data uh, from our spacecraft are actually downloadable um, on some specific websites, so we can have an idea of the unique users accessing these data, downloading the data, the volume of the data that are downloaded. So that's also one of the indicators. Uh, knowledge transfer, so more uh, longer term impact. So knowledge cross fertilization. So when we see that uh, these programs are, um, are uh, used in papers in other domains. So this is what we call knowledge cross fertilization. Industrial cross fertilization is, uh, for example, the, the, the referred papers where you have a collaboration between public and private partners. A fourth type of, um, of impact and indicator is the international cooperation of scientists with, uh, for example, some measurements of international co-authoring. So this is for an example of the scientific impact. If I look then at the strategic impact, we are looking at the impact on international cooperation with uh, figures like the scientific regional investment. Um, industry competitiveness with, uh, for example, uh, patents developed uh, thanks to this um, to these activities and European non-dependency with um, a measurement which is most of the time qualitative of the level of criticality of the knowledge acquired. Societal impact examples, so public inspiration. So here you will find active and passive users inspiration on social media, visibility in the media. Education, number of PhD theses that are uh, based on, um, on, the, on data from our missions. Environment and sustainability, for example, how our scientific program contributes to the space weather programs, as there is um, weather uh, on Earth, there is weather in space, import, very, um, very important these days. So this is a contribution to the, the overall environment sustainability uh, of our scientific activities. And last but not least, economic impact. So typically, uh, GVA, GDP impact, so gross value added. Um, economic multipliers, job supported, um, although we also have the jobs attractiveness, trying to see uh, the, the success of uh, the vacancy uh, posted, so number of applications received, for instance. And very important for us, innovation and technology transfer with uh, typically uh, technological spin-offs or uh, spillovers. Just uh, an example of, exa of what, what our uh, member states are very interested in. Uh, this is the example of our Earth Observation Envelope program. The type of figures uh, they are very sensitive to are, are these ones. Basically, these, uh, these multiplier figures in terms of GDP increase or innovation spillovers. So here, the example is that every year spent in, uh, in ESA future year programs is actually creation of uh, 3.8 euros of... Um, of uh, valuing our member states over a period that is almost 20 years. Uh, we also look at, for example, uh, the tax revenues. And here for that specific example, we could identify that more than 60% of the investment made by our member states was recovered in tax revenue. And also in terms of job, also multipliers for each uh, new job in the space sector, 1.3 additional jobs is created in the wider economy for that specific program. I'm almost done, just want to, uh, to invite you, if you're interested, to visit our website. There you will find a number of publications on our socioeconomic impact assessments, as well on methodological aspects. You will also find, as is presented here, some articles about, for example, here, case studies on, um, on the benefits of uh, here obs Earth observation data. 
So uh, uh, you can find basically this is really the entry point for all our activities related to uh, space economy and socioeconomic impact assessment. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think we will take questions after uh, the last presenter. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. It was very inspiring. Thanks also for sticking to the time allocation, which make my job easier. So um, we have now the third speaker, uh, Massimo Florio. Massimo is professor of public economics at the Department of Economics, Management and Quantitative Methods of the University of Milan. He has also been awarded by the European Commission a Jean Monnet Chair of Economics of European Integration and subsequently the Jean Monnet Chair Ad Personam of EU Industrial Policy. He is currently the scientific coordinator of a Jean Monnet network of six universities. After graduating at the University of Rome and obtaining a Master in Applied Economics at Zistau and holding teaching positions in different universities in Italy, he spent three years as a visiting scholar at the LSE, another British university. So, Massimo, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I, I, I would start with a, a triple thank you because this is the third time I, am, I have been invited at the FCC week. So, thank you, thank you, thank you for all those uh, opportunities. What uh, I'm going to do today is uh, uh, to tell you something about the progress we have made in uh, over uh, uh, six years now working on uh, the uh, cost-benefit analysis of research infrastructure. So this is the structure of uh, uh, my presentation. I, I, I will try to distill um, some lessons from um, recent empirical findings um, in, 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 our, in our work. And I... Uh, and I also present some ideas for future activities. Um, this is just to tell you visually what is my background. It is more than 20 years of uh, cost-benefit analysis of infrastructures in, in general, including infrastructures in uh, um, transport, telecommunications, uh, um, uh, energy, and more recently in the last edition of the um, European Commission guide, um, mm, there is a chapter on uh, cost-benefit analysis of uh, research development and, and innovation. I, I have chaired uh, the team or coordinated the team preparing all these editions of the guide, but uh, every time I, I uh, learn something new, for instance, um, as part of the FCC collaboration on the economics perspective, I have been learning uh, a, a lot with following my uh, in interplay interactions of my team with colleagues working at the um, FCC uh, study. Um, we have a, um, a, a coordinating board where there are um, Michael Benedict, obviously, Johannes Gutleber and the other um, scientists and colleagues there. And now uh, I am also in the REPATS project, which has been mentioned before uh, by um, <clears throat> Alistair. So um, what is different from uh, um, what we do and what other people do? Uh, what we do is uh, um, trying uh, to uh, test a model. So this is a model uh, for the cost-benefit analysis of research infrastructure that we have been designing and empirically testing over the years. Uh, I'm not going in the details, but uh, the, uh, the, the story here is that uh, we, we want to uh, compute an intertemporal uh, uh, net present value of a research infrastructure, and uh, uh, we uh, suggest to uh, have two components. One component is the net present value for users of the infrastructure in a broad sense, and the benefits for non-users, such as the general public. Um, 
this very simple equation can then be written down uh, in such a, a way that uh, you have different components for uh, empirical analysis. For instance, uh, integrated benefits for scientists, integrated benefits for PhD students, technical students, postdocs, and so on, um, benefits for firms uh, directly involved in uh, procurement, benefits for uh, certain uh, users of uh, applied research infrastructure, such as uh, synchrotrons for uh, uh, adron therapy or for uh, material sciences, um, um, cultu direct cultural benefits uh, for uh, people visiting the research infrastructures as they, uh, as they, if they were visiting a, a museum or um, a, a cultural um, infrastructure. Then, and I will present you particularly this today, the benefits to non-users arising just from the knowledge that some kind of discoveries are done. Then there are the costs, which are the standard capital labor operating costs uh, and uh, any negative externalities. Um, the point is having all this expressed in a numeraire, which could be euro or uh, whatever you wish, but the point is having a numeraire. Otherwise, you cannot, um, you cannot sum or subtract uh, anything. And then there is a discount factor to uh, taking into account the future. Obviously, if um, uh, you are a philosopher and you think that uh, infinity is um, uh, something interesting, um, uh, so that you do not want to have uh, a time horizon, uh, you just uh, put this R uh, to uh, um, zero, so that at that point, one euro today is the same as uh, one euro in uh, 100,000 years. Now, what kind of progress we have been doing? Um, definitely, we got something in terms of results uh, working on, on, on procurement. We uh, have been working on a large sample of uh, um, orders uh, uh, from uh, uh, particularly focusing on the Large Hadron Collider, but we have considered also a wider databases. This is uh, the, uh, the time structure of uh, uh, orders, uh, uh, each more than 10,000 uh, Swiss francs. And we have tested this with a variety of, uh, of methods. I'm not going to uh, go in detail. Uh, one Qualitative thing is available there is this uh, booklet with uh, narratives about uh, um, uh, about uh, case studies of firms. But we did something else. We um, interviewed companies. Uh, we uh, studied recently patent databases, and uh, where perhaps we did. Uh, really new things was looking at uh, uh, um, balance sheet data from, from the firms. This is about balance sheet data. We recently published uh, in, uh, in uh, the journal Research Policy um, an econometric analysis uh, of the impact of CERN uh, on uh, um, different performance measures of, uh, of, uh, of firms. The idea here is to have a system of simultaneous equation in which the trigger is the order received by CERN, controlling for a number of covariates. This has an impact on research development of firms because uh, uh, many of these orders are not off the shelf. Uh, firms have to produce new things and to study how to produce new things following uh, the uh, strict technological requirement by CERN. This uh, um, impact on research development uh, um, in turn triggers an impact on uh, uh, patents filed. 
this has later an effect on productivity, and in the end, this effect on productivity uh, has an effect on uh, revenues and profits. The important point of this uh, econometric model is that th this is uh, uh, purely empirical and objective. We are not interviewing firms. These are not narratives. We are just looking to balance sheets of firms before and after the orders for a large number of firms and for a large number of uh, years. And we got uh, statistically significant coefficients for, um, for those, for those um, uh, samples. This is a Bayesian network. In a Bayesian ne this is based on a, um, a survey of more than 600 uh, interviewed firms. Here, what we wanted to study was the interrelation between different uh, um, variables uh, which can have an impact uh, on the performance of, of the firms. Um, the key results here is that uh, the governance of uh, the procurement mechanism is key in uh, getting a certain performance, particularly the relational governance, in which uh, uh, the uh, CERN scientists and engineers actually collaborate with the firm. So it is not just the firm is responding to a, 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 a call by, by the CERN, but there is a learning mechanism uh, which involves together the, the two parties. This is uh, the most recent result, which is not yet published. Again, it is an econometric model, but the intuition uh, is that uh, we, we want to see whether um, in uh, time zero, which is uh, when uh, the first order uh, is, uh, is received by the firm, there is a, a significant statistical difference uh, in the number of patents filed. And uh, mm, visually, this tells you that there is an effect. So over time, we can see that uh, firms involved in procurement with CERN patent more. But another interesting result is that the gestation lag is, uh, is long. So it takes uh, five to eight years to get these results. And this confirms that firms had to digest uh, the, the, the learning process. This is very experiment, very, very new. Uh, is an, an attempt to, to uh, give a value to free and open source uh, software released by, by CERN. We very recently interviewed around 200 users of uh, Root, a popular um, library uh, released for free uh, since uh, several years uh, by, by CERN. And the key in this analysis was asking people um, how much time uh, having a root uh, um, saves them in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of time. Um, because uh, users, uh, in fact, tell us that uh, for different functionalities of uh, this software, they save time. And because time has an opportunity cost, if you can use this information to uh, get um, a, a, um, an idea about uh, the benefits to users that could uh, uh, give you an idea about uh, the value of uh, free uh, software. By the way, this is um, uh, rather higher, uh, rather higher than uh, a, a model based on uh, production cost. Um, which is available for, uh, for root, uh, which would give you this kind of figure per year based on the uh, average uh, uh, number of lines of, uh, of codes. Our results uh, is uh, something as uh, uh, two times or three times higher than uh, this uh, cost-based view of producing the software, just because even if you are not involved in producing the software, you get the cadeau, you get the present of uh, uh, a community of thousands of uh, developers that, in a sense, works for you in creating, uh, in creating knowledge. This is another recent result. Um, we had a, a previous study 
um, in which uh, we interviewed uh, uh, students and uh, uh, postdocs and tried to understand what is uh, their uh, um, uh, benefit of having been at, uh, at CERN. Uh, in the end, with the statistical analysis of the um, re responses we get from these surveys uh, of two samples of students and former students, we, we got a, a premium um, of, uh, in, a, in a range of uh, 5 to 12 percent compared to uh, peers um, in, in physics or computing science and, and so on, which cannot add CERN in their, or, or Large Hadron Collider, or an experiment uh, such as ATLAS or CMS in, uh, in their CV. Uh, last year, what we did was to ask uh, the, um, the uh, team leaders, uh, more than uh, 300 team leaders in different collaborations, uh, if they were able to confirm this, this range. And these are the, the, the results. Uh, something is 85% uh, um, of the team leaders confirm uh, the, the results. So now we really are rather confident about the fact that there is this uh, salary premium confirmed by students, postdocs, and, and professors, including professors who know different types of students, some of them going elsewhere. Value of fun. Um, now we move a little bit outside science. We move uh, uh, to uh, impact on the general public. Um, there are different examples in science. This is probably the most striking example, the most striking example, the NASA Kennedy Space Center with 1.5 million visitors per year. Um, um, in order to get a similar figure for CERN, you have to integrate uh, uh, a number of, of years. The scale is different, but, um, but CERN has uh, a, a, a science gateway project that uh, probably would try to replicate some of the NASA experience there. And there is also the virtual dimension of uh, this uh, story. A very successful platform is uh, Zooniverse, where there are millions of amateur scientists working on objects such as uh, um, galaxy clusters. And in fact, there is also a program uh, under the label Higgs Hunters, in which uh, simplified uh, uh, structures of collisions are represented and uh, um, citizen scientists uh, are asked to um, see whether there, is, whether there are anomalies of the vertex um, events. Okay, this is again about the value of fun. Uh, two colleagues, uh, one is sitting there, Irene Crispo with uh, Jessica Catalano in Milan, uh, patiently analyzed uh, the um, things such as uh, visits in, uh, in, uh, in the websites uh, or uh, um, YouTube. Again, now, again, because there is a time dimension in, in this, if you watch in uh, YouTube for some minutes uh, something, you are investing your time. Because your time has an opportunity cost, this is a straightforward uh, way to uh, um, compute uh, a benefit. And in, in the case of, uh, of CERN, the uh, benefit uh, computed by uh, Irene and, and Jessica in the case of uh, YouTube is uh, substantial. Now, I, I, I will spend the last uh, four minutes or so of my presentation with what is probably our most interesting result. This is a, a first time worldwide. We um, wanted to perform a so-called contingent valuation experiment, which is well known in environmental economics. Um, in this case, it was done with uh, French taxpayers, which uh, were exposed to a short presentation about what uh, CERN does and uh, um, there were two scenarios. One scenario in which uh, uh, CERN invests, 
in a future particle accelerator and another scenario in which CERN uh, has a conservative strategy in which doesn't invest. So in compliance with uh, certain guidelines uh, prepared in the United States uh, by the uh, National Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Adm Administration, we uh, asked uh, the question, would you agree to pay the amount of a certain bit of money per year as a taxpayer for the construction of a new particle accelerator at CERN as described in scenario I, A. And uh, the strategy um, uh, was a so-called uh, um, double-bounded uh, um, bidding system in which uh, you uh, ask in a referendum like a question such as uh, three euro per year if uh, the respondent says no, you go uh, down to two. If uh, uh, she says yes, you go up to five. Uh, this is standard and tested many times in uh, cultural goods and environmental economics, but was never tested in the case of science. And, um, well, the, the surprising result is this one. Uh, when you integrate with this kind of models that consider also a number of coverages, uh, the, the average uh, willingness to pay, um, um, the unconditional maximum is uh, 13 per year. If you condition these uh, with uh, uh, age of respondents, education, and so on, this is four per year. And the good news uh, is that this is uh, 1.5 more than what actually France contributes per year and per capita to, uh, to serve. So this was an experiment. We, we were not sure that uh, the result uh, was uh, uh, with uh, this direction. It could have been in the other direction. We are now repeating this experiment in Switzerland, and uh, that's it. Now, lesson learned. Lesson learned are, first, technological learning through procurement is not a narrative. It's something that we can measure. Second. Value of free and open uh, source software is something that can be evaluated with a strategy pointing to the uh, value of time uh, saved by users. Third, human capital, um, the salary premium is confirmed three times by students, postdocs, and professors. Fourth, cultural effects. Uh, looking at what happens in the social media, in the websites, and in the traditional media, it is clear that large research infrastructure as CERN are also cultural enterprises. And finally, there is the public good value. It is, it is, uh, it is uh, really appropriate to think that scientists work on behalf of the society. People, even if they do not understand what a Higgs boson is, are happy to know that there are scientists working on this, and they are prepared to pay for this. So it is not that the governments are bribed or uh, are uh, pushed by the scientists to do something for the benefit of the scientists, but it is true that uh, governments are at at least in some cases, correctly interpreting social preferences. Not of, the, not of everybody. In the case of our experiment in France, uh, something as 49% of the respondents were not prepared to pay. And this uh, means that all the outreach activities uh, take another dimension. These are some indications for uh, future research. Uh, particularly want uh, to understand better the downstream economic effects of innovation, for instance, vacuum, cryogenics, and magnets technologies. This is something that uh, until now is outside the scope, of, the scope of what we have done, but we, we would like to try. For software and IT, this is a very initial case study. We want to do uh, much more on that in consultation with uh, computer scientists, as we did for this uh, uh, first uh, survey, which was uh, uh, 
could discuss, was discussed with the people of the root team. For human capital, we would like to have control groups in uh, um, different uh, universities and uh, research infrastructure. For cultural effects, uh, we would need a lot more of analytics about what happens in, uh, in the web. And for the public good value, uh, after replication in Switzerland, we would like to replicate this in other uh, member states. So that's all, and um, for more on this, please wait October when my book uh, will be published in which uh, everything will be uh, told in, uh, in detail. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for this presentation. So, I think that we have some time now for um, questions. I think that we have something more than 20 minutes. So, I'm sure that there will be some requests for clarifications or for further discussions. So, if you want to open. So, I would like to make a question regarding the presentation from ESA and in particular on the assessment of societal impact. Uh, you mentioned some indicators, and uh, I was wondering whether you have already in practice um, linkages between societal impact and the SDGs, and some, uh, something specifically for that, and also how, you, if and how uh, you take into consideration uh, uh, societal risks within this analysis. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so you, we're mentioning the SDGs, UN SDGs. So we have, uh, we have actually a link for the very reason that we have within the agency what we call the SDG catalog, meaning that we are trying to figure out a number of ways in which our activities, space activities in Europe, contribute to each of these SDGs. So there is a systematic approach, complementary to what you saw, but somehow linked in trying to extract from all this work what is related to the, uh, to the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So this work is actually ongoing, specific focus on, on, on these goals. Uh, your second question regarded societal impacts and risks. Um, I don't know exactly what you meant behind that. I think it's quite limited. Uh, there are a number of things that we look at, but I don't think that's what you're, uh, you're referring to. Uh, you had in mind uh, uh, in, indeed we we are I, mean, I think in terms of socioeconomic impact assessment it's it's there is definitely i think a focus on benefits that's for sure However, risks are definitely taken into account in a number of things. Uh, I can give, for example, we, we have done some work on our rockets, typically environmental impact. Um, there are some regulations that could impact directly the type of, uh, of, um, of fuel that we could use or, um, or propellant that we could use. So this is something that is taken into account, definitely. And I, I should say also, I, I've mentioned uh, very briefly, an activity that's called Clean Space, uh, which is ongoing at the moment. And as part of this activity, we are doing life cycle assessment of all our activities, including indeed uh, environmental impact. Uh, my question is to Professor Florio. Uh, 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 concerning the, the impact uh, on industry through procurement and uh, your study of the, the LHC uh, uh, expenditure. It seems to me, well, you showed that your model has uh, folded in the time in it through uh, uh, discounting and, and the calculation of NPVs. Uh, but I saw also that you took, uh, at least in the example you showed, uh, the first procurement action, uh, which is the placement of, of the contract. And in fact, uh, the activity, with the industrial activity and ultimately the transfer of money occurs several years after this. For example, your, your, your bar diagram showed that the peak of 
number of contracts played by, uh, placed by CERN for LHC construction, uh, this peaked in uh, 2003. And the expenditure peaked in uh, at least two years later, uh, uh, if not three years. So in fact, if you, if you apply, if you fold it in time in your model, uh, maybe uh, the, uh, through discounting, maybe you should not take the first procurement action, which is placement of the contract, as the reference date. Now, this is a, a, an interesting point to, which allows me to clarify one, one issue. Differently from the kind of uh, previous exercise in which they computed multipliers of expenditure using, uh, uh, using average input-output multipliers, what, the, what, we, what we do is different. We, um, we take the first order as a, a, a trigger of a initial research and development investment by, by the firm. So the idea is that if you have to respond to provide a new magnet, a new cryogenic solution, at that point, even before you, you get all the money from the CERN, which as you perfectly uh, mentioned, may have certain delay, you have to start research and development. Then it, from, from there, it will, it will take you five to eight years to get, for instance, a, a patent and uh, exploit these uh, to uh, other customers. So I don't think uh, we, th there is a contradiction. Uh, there are two different perspectives. One perspective is money going from CERN to the company. The other perspective is what uh, uh, happens in the company, uh, in the mind of engineers, uh, in the investment they have to do, including uh, investment in human capital, intellectual investment, to respond to the kind of stimulus. So, in a sense, the CERN is uh, offering two kinds of stimulus. One is money, and the other is an intellectual stimulus. If I, if I may add, which may occur before the placement of the contract. So, in fact, because for the big contracts, most of the companies were already uh, acculturated, to use the standard word, uh, to the uh, domain, and they did some, in fact, uh, uh, preliminary development. So I, I, I'm just, my point is just that the, the time origin is something which is not so clear. Huh? We have a question there and then another one there. Massimo? Yes, um, I have a question for the first two presenters in, in particular. Uh, I work at the European Research Council, so it's a, it's a funding agency in this case, but we face very difficult, very uh, similar challenges in uh, assessing impact uh, as those that have been presented. And of course, in terms of how to go about this, we end up with very similar frameworks than those you have presented. So uh, categories of impact, and then we have indicators, core indicators, non-core indicators. Um, and we go through these lists of indicators. And, and one thing that we find is that is, uh, it is as important to look at, at what indicators you want as it is to find the right sources for the data. Um, and in particular, what, what, we, what we see as, as more powerful uh, is external data. So data that is not just in our databases, but data that comes from traces that have been left externally uh, somewhere of activities. Because this kind of data um, is validated externally and it can also be aggregated. It, that means that it's not data that is produced by us, but it's data produced externally and they can put us in the context of external activities. Uh, so what I was wondering is whether um, in our iPads, for example, uh, you have discussed this because you, you have shown this list of indicators, but I was wondering if uh, this is part of your thinking of what you are going to recommend 
uh, on our side, for example, we are trying to push a lot for publishing uh, data by others uh, and to push for standards so that this, this data is published in a similar way. And also in the, in the case of ESA, if you also have this concern of trying to find and rely more and more on external data sets, and, and if you're interested maybe in exchanging with us on how you do it and uh, what could, can be done in this respect. Yeah, so I think maybe just to underline, we, we intentionally didn't start with indicators because uh, we had the view that this was going to skew the discussion and, and skew the thinking uh, because it's a bit, you know, like the, the looking for your keys under the, the lamppost. So you start by thinking, well, what indicator do I have? Can I track? And so that's what we didn't do. Um, so the indicators have come in a second phase after we've discussed impacts and what sort of imp and got people to really conceptualize the sorts of impacts they could imagine in a range of fields. Um, and I think in terms of the, the methods and the data sources, I think Massimo and, and, and also the, the presentation on ESA have shown that there are, there are indeed a range of, of data sources that you can apply. Some of them are internal, so I, I'm working on one of the S3 uh, ad hoc working groups that uh, Margarida uh, mentioned from, from the Commission side, um, looking at key performance indicators. And again, we're, we're tackling the same sort of issues there, you know, what indicators or what data does a research infrastructure have internally or should have internally and what ones does it need to access and, and assure the quality of. And I think that's something that we, we will include in, in the final guidance that we're, we're going to prepare and, and, and also in, in the piloting phase will be to look at what are the sorts of data sets you can, you can use to you know, assess impact. So you can, in human resource field, for instance, you can think about different ways of capturing data in terms of career impacts and there are people working on, on using big data around uh, recruitment sites and so on to, to measure the sort of value of, of, jo of, of uh, yeah, different types of categories of, of, of personnel. So that could be something that could be used in the future. And I think Massimo's presentation is showing the use of YouTube data, which is obviously a different external sort of data that, we, that normally wouldn't be thought about uh, from uh, the perspective of an RI. It gives an example of the sorts of d data sets. But... I think before getting to data and indicators, the, the key issue is what is it we need to track? What is it we should be tracking? What would be nice to track if we have the data? And, that's, and that, help, that thought process, I think, is very helpful not to waste time or, or either looking for data that's difficult to get or, or data that's very costly sometimes as well. So it's, I think all of these steps are, are very useful to getting to an overall framework that's applicable and cost effective because not all RIs have the budget of CERN to, to, I think, or, or other larger ones to, to spend on, on very large-scale impact assessments. Yeah, on my, on my side, I can only, um, you know, support what was just said. Um, I don't know if you remember in, in, one, in the slides presenting, you know, the, the, the framework for the assessment, the third bullet was actually analysis of the sources of data. And this is, uh, you know, certainly key, and I think even before thinking about uh, what you want to measure, what we discuss with our colleagues when they come with their specific program is really, let's you know, take into account what you can actually access in what format and so on. Um, and so we're getting data not only internally, but also externally with our industrial partners, but also uh, outside of, of that. Um, for the studies, for most of the studies, we are also relying on external contractors who are actually also bringing in their own sources of data, which we are then checking with them. So certainly it's key to the success of the work. Um, and so on, again, I mean, we're happy to, to exchange with you, uh, but on our side, indeed, we are using uh, a number of different sources of data. And we're also trying to a certain extent to, uh, I wouldn't say standardize, but really uh, reaching for, you know, every time for a new, st uh, new analysis, ensuring that uh, we have, uh, we have a, a set of data that is coherent with respect to what we usually use. Thank you. I think we have a question here. Thank you, a question, especially for the last presentation. Um, when, because in your presentation, you, uh, you speak about CERN, so a large scale. Uh, uh, and when, uh, personally, I work at the Flemish level, uh, one of the problem, at the Flemish level, one of the problems we have, more you go at the smaller scale, uh, uh, more difficulties to show the, the various impacts, uh, especially uh, in the case of uh, mid-size or small-size universities, which were, 
what we do. And one of the risks, which is uh, clearly related to this, is to say, let's go for larger infrastructure because it's easier to show the, the impact. So I would like to have some reflection uh, on, on the issues of the scale uh, from large to mid. Clearly, we could elaborate a bit more. But because what we notice is more we go to the smaller scale, more the ecosystem uh, where is a research infrastructure allocated matters, but I would like your uh, opinion on this. We have, uh, <coughs> well, obviously, if the scale is uh, is too small, uh, it is difficult to uh, measure some certain impacts, but uh, we have a, a fully developed cost-benefit analysis of uh, CNAO, which is uh, uh, a hadron therapy center uh, near Milan. Um, the, the scale of the investment uh, is uh, several several times less than the large hadron collider. So in many countries, there are now this kind of facilities. Another one we probably will try to develop in, within uh, uh, RIPAT uh, is the ALBA uh, synchrotron near Barcelona. Um, I wouldn't say that there is a, is a, 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 a Catalan, you're Flemish, it is not a Catalan infrastructure, it is uh, mostly a, a Spanish government and Catalan government infrastructure with uh, something as 80% of users from Spain. So if we can try uh, to, uh, to show that uh, some kind of serious uh, analysis could be done at that scale that would uh, empirically answer your, your question. I know that Silvia is now working on a distributed infrastructure even smaller in the, in the case. Uh, you, you can tell people what you are doing. Yes, we have just prepared um, a socioeconomic impact assessment and a cost-benefit analysis for the research infrastructure, uh, European research infrastructure on heritage science and it is a distributed uh, facility that is on the preparatory phase in this moment, uh, and it will deliver services in terms of access to both physical and digital um, services to the scientific community in the heritage science. Uh, and the scale is much, much lower than the CERN. Uh, it will be operating starting in 2026. And it has, uh, it will have a running cost of 2 million euros uh, per year. So we are talking about it. it's a small, it will have a central hub office in Florence of 10 people, 10, 12 people. So we are talking about something that is rather small. So in this case, there the challenge is that the, they pretty much uh, the value of what they do is a coordinating activity of some already existing facilities. So basically what you have to demonstrate is the value of coordination and integration of different existing facilities. So that is the challenge of what we have to do. And we went pretty much in the direction that Massimo showed in terms of um, time saving of the scientific community in having better and more productive uh, services, uh, accessing to, to better services for their uh, scientific production. The fact that you have a smaller, uh, uh, a smaller unit of analysis is also simplifies also a little bit your job because the, the, the type of people you have to talk to or the, the so to say the borders of what you are assessing is relatively better uh, um, understandable. So in the case of CERN, it was very complex exercise because you have to deal with very different aspects of what they do. So yes, of course, there are, there are pros and cons in, in um, looking at smaller scale type of infrastructure. Are there any other burning questions there? The last one, I would say we take the last one. opportunity to uh, say something on this subject. Sorry, I come late, so I did not uh, listen to the talks, but uh, I like this subject. So I think I'm uh, personally, I'm a big amateur of uh, uh, large science and the facilities, and I think uh, a human being have been uh, doing that. It's no, uh, we, no need for us to give lessons to certain people, so they, are, uh, they have been in front of this uh, endeavor. Uh, I think personally, I think uh, a human being, uh, they do this kind of thing first. The goal is not science even. They are 
shaping themselves. So they, uh, they uh, through doing so-called signs and uh, large signs, they uh, learn how to do it uh, in a complicated way. And uh, uh, both, uh, for example, I, the high energy physics domain is extremely uh, unique. So this field is different from the others. So inside we have, a, like a NEMA a theorist, and we have a, a experimentalist, accelerator detector, and industry, and also politicians. And so this is a very complicated thing. So you need to to produce uh, two two hundred euro a Higgs is not easy. You cannot do it uh, in an easy way. So you need to spend five billion uh, US dollar to make it and to mo mobilize uh, uh, the whole world to do it. So I think the impact to the uh, uh, to the society extremely uh, important. Uh, and also smaller thing, you cannot touch, you cannot push, you cannot give the level of the requirement for your industry system. So the large science, uh, it, it, because of science, I mean, uh, they give uh, the requirement of the luminosity, and in fact, this goes back to the cryogenic system, the, high, uh, the, 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 the cholesterols and the vacuum systems, and the many, many things, uh, electronics, chips. So. I think this is uh, extremely good uh, for us to work on large science uh, facilities to really pay back to the society. I think we have calculated the impact of uh, uh, CPC and uh, compared with IOC. The, impact, the, the feedback is uh, a factor of uh, a, 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 more, a little bit more than three. Of course, this depending on the model dependent. So, uh, depending on the, what what is your model, IOC is about two or something like that. If you talk about space si uh, space technology, they they can give this number to hundred and thousand. So, depending on how, they, of course, they have more e economic uh, uh, feedback. So, anyway, maybe I'm not uh, so call especially to the session topics because I come late. But uh, I, I heard the end of some discussions about uh, the small scale uh, things and the large scale things. And in fact, this FCC is a, a large uh, science uh, project. So uh, personally, I think this is human endeavor. And I think uh, uh, either IOC, CPC, FCC, I think this is good to encourage. And I think this is good to pursue. And I hope at least one of them can be succeeded. Okay, thanks a lot for this remark. Does anybody want to add something or reply? Okay. Uh, Riccardo Crescenzi, London School of Economics. Uh, Massimo, a question regarding the assessment of the additionality of certain procurement. Um, how do you select a suitable counterfactual for the firms that act as suppliers? In the sense, to what extent the impact that you calculate is how good CERN is in selecting its suppliers so that these firms could have been more innovative in any case, even without, so they became suppliers because they were innovative. So they were like in an upward trend in terms of their like innovative capabilities versus the additional impact of um, the procurement itself. Uh, in obviously, uh uh, this is the first question that came uh, in mind when you, you work on these things. The econometric strategy that we used was uh, um, a, a, a before-after strategy. So, um, in a sense, our counterfactual is the, is the fact that uh, um, for each of those years, you can split the sample in uh, uh, before and after and test where the uh, your your zero time is. So uh, this is a substitute in a sense of a difference in difference uh, model without using a counterfactual because the counterfactual is given by the firm themselves in their before life. To be sure that uh, you are not uh, getting uh, co uh, confounding factors, there are a number of covariates in, in, including the the, 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 the country and, uh, and time effects. So the model is controlled. The way we did this is uh, working on the balance sheets. So, so we are entirely, and, uh, and this is bad, we are ignorant about what happened. We 
we have narratives that uh, say that after you get uh, the, the order by CERN, then after some time you will be able to, to sell in other markets. But uh, while we did this uh, in the Bayesian network analysis based on surveys, in this case it is just the, uh, the, the, the balance sheets that speak for themselves. And in the new study we are now doing with Andrea Bastianin, who is uh, here and others, we are doing the same with patents. So this, this is the way. Uh, a, a little bit more technical answer is about the fact that the, the counterfactual story and the treatment uh, effect in the case of science has the limitation that in some cases only some firms in the world are able to do those things. So you cannot find a clone to randomly extract from the world doing the same thing be simply because those firms are already engaged by, by CERN because they are the best in the, in the world. Okay, thanks a lot everybody. I think that after all these food for thoughts we deserve some real food for lunch. So enjoy your lunch. We reconvene in one hour at 1.30. Is that true? Yes, one. Okay, thank you. One and a half. One and a half. Yeah, yeah.